Thank you so much for having me. I'm Andrew. Uh, I'm a fifth year PhD student at MIT. And I'm here to talk about some of our recent work on what we call data models. And I will explain them in the coming slides. Um, so I wanted to start this talk out by thinking about what we call the anatomy of a machine learning prediction. So let's start by thinking of just any machine learning prediction. So we could be doing image classification where a prediction consists of an image uh, X and a corresponding, um, you know, like label prediction, like dog with 85% confidence. And sort of intuitively, we know that this uh, machine learning prediction, uh, you know, is affected by the training set S that we use to train the model and the learning algorithm that we apply to this training set to get the model. And these two factors sort of combine in some way to give us uh, a given machine learning prediction. So the question we wanted to tackle in this work is how exactly do these two factors combine to give us uh, this prediction? Um, and the framework that we propose for dealing with this, if it wasn't clear from the title of the talk, is called data models. Um, and the data models paper is joint work with my collaborators, uh, Sam Park, Logan Engstrom, Kiyom Leclerc, and Alexander Madri at MIT. Um, oh, another thing that I should say, um, just because I'm not sure everyone was on the Zoom, is if you have any questions, uh, I can't see the chat super well, so feel free to just interrupt. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, before I introduce what a data model is, I first want to introduce this really useful primitive that we call the model output function. So the model output function is a function of two arguments. The first argument is a given specific uh, test input X. So for example, this image of a dog, which has the label dog. The second argument, sorry, the second argument uh, is a subset as prime of some larger training set that we're interested in studying. So if we're studying ImageNet, then you know this image X is just some image from the ImageNet test set, and S prime is any subset of the ImageNet training set. The output of this function is some quantity of interest uh, measured from model. So for example, the loss or the margin or anything uh, evaluated on the example X after training the model on S prime. So you can imagine, um, given our question from the first slide of like, how, do the, uh, how does the data set and the learning algorithm combine to yield the model prediction is all sort of wrapped up into this model F. If we understood this model F, the question would be answered. Um, because it maps directly from you know, the test example we're studying and some training data to the model prediction. The problem is that we actually can't study this F. It's too complicated. So for example, it might involve doing you know, hundreds of thousands of steps of SGD on S prime and then evaluating some really big neural network with some weird loss on X. And so what we propose to do is study some surrogate function, F hat. Um, and f hat, we want to satisfy two properties. First of all, we wanted to reasonably approximate f um, so that any conclusions we draw about f hat um, also apply to f. And secondly, we want it to be simple and easy to analyze so that we actually can draw conclusions about f hat. And so this is sort of the main idea behind data modeling is we take this complicated model output function and we approximate it with some much simpler function that takes in the same arguments and outputs what we hope is a good approximation of f. Okay, so how do we even do this? Um, where do we start? Well, one reasonable idea and what we do in our paper is let's start by fixing a specific target example x. So let's say we're only interested in understanding model predictions on that specific dog image that I showed in the previous slide. Well, one idea is to use supervised learning. And what I mean by that is we can take our you know, larger training set S and subsample um, some of the points, a random subset of the points. So here I've highlighted in blue what we'll call S prime. We'll then train a model on S prime and evaluate it on this example X. And those two things together, the subset and the you know, evaluated model output will be one input label pair. Then we'll sample another random subset train a model on that random subset and record the output on X and then record that pair. And we'll do this over and over and over again, M times. Then what we'll do is actually fit a parametric model that maps from S, from the subset SI to the corresponding model output, F of X comma SI. Cool, okay, so that's the generic, that's the general um, sort of data modeling framework. There are some design questions uh, to be able to instantiate this for real. 
So one question is how exactly do we generate the data? What subsets should we choose? The second question is what sort of model do we fit? So I kind of waved my hands and said, we'll fit a parametric model from the subsets to the corresponding model outputs, but which parametric model should we fit and how should we fit it? Okay, the answer to the first question is kind of boring. And so I'm not gonna discuss it in this talk, but it's uh, the information on how we chose this is in our paper. We're gonna sample just random sort of fixed size fractions uh, of the total training set S. The more interesting question is what sort of model do we fit? Um, and so remember when we were kind of uh, motivating data models, we wanted two properties. We wanted to be able to approximate model outputs. But we also wanted it to be simple and easy to analyze. So what we said is, okay, let's forget about approximating model outputs and let's just go for the simplest, most easy to analyze thing we can think of. And so what we chose is just a simple linear model. And what I mean by linear, is that we chose this sort of parametric function G of any subset S to be a, a product of just a dot product of two vectors. The first vector is what we call the indicator vector for S prime. So this is a length, um, a vector whose size is the size of the training set. And it has zeros wherever we didn't include an image and ones wherever we did include an image in S prime. So if this was, for example, the subset S prime that we selected, the corresponding indicator vector just looks like this. The second uh, item in our dot product is a learned parameter specific to the test example X that we're studying. So you can think of this as a vector of weights where we have one weight per training example. Okay, so that's going to be our model class. Now, the very last question is how do we fit this model class to actually predict the model outputs that we first cared about. So remember from a few slides ago, what we have is this sort of data set of random subsets of the, of the training set and what happened when we trained on those subsets and evaluated on X. And what we're going to do, uh, and we have our model class, which is just the indicator vector times the learned parameter. And so what we're going to do, uh, this should look very familiar. This is just a simple, um, L1 regularized linear regression. So we're going to minimize over all possible weights, uh, average over all the sampled subset, all the subsets that we sampled, you know, S1 through SM. Uh, and then we're going to sort of minimize the difference between the predicted model output, which is just the stop product, and the actual true model output when training on SI. And then we added some L1 regularization um, for sparsity and generalization purposes. I'm happy to talk about that after as well. Okay, so just one slide putting it all together and then I'll pause in case um, there are any questions on how uh, this framework works at all. Okay, so I'm gonna, to make this sort of super concrete, I'm gonna talk about how we constructed data models for deep neural networks trained on the CIFAR-10 data set. We're gonna repeat the following thing 500 times, 500,000 times. We're first gonna choose a random alpha fraction of the CIFAR-10 training set. Then we're gonna train a deep neural network, so for us a ResNet-9, on this random subset. And we're going to measure um, the correct class margin. Um, you can think of this as just any loss function on every single test image in the CIFAR-10 test set. Then for each test image, we're going to record the pair, uh, characteristic or indicator vector of the subset, and the vector of all of the margins. Okay. After we've done this, we're then going to go for every single test image. We're going to fit a linear model from the collected indicator vectors to the collected margins for that test image. Um, and just a note before I talk about what the final output is, the only reason we were able to do this uh, is that we actually developed a fast training library called FFCV. Um, if you're interested in that, um, it's what let us like train 500,000 CIFAR models, because you'll notice that we casually trained 500,000 random subsets of CIFAR um, is because, you know, we did all this engineering work and we were able to train uh, CIFAR models at like two model, uh, two seconds per model, I think. Okay, so the final output of this process is 10,000 uh, data models, you know, and each data model is a vector, theta x that lies in R50,000, where 50,000 is the size of the CIFAR 10 training set. Okay, so I'll pause really briefly for questions. Um, 
And then if there are no questions, I'll, I'll forge ahead. Okay, awesome. Um, in that case, I'll just keep going. But again, feel free to just interrupt me if, uh, if anything's unclear. Okay, so by this point, you should be convinced that um, data models, we can estimate them and that they're simple to analyze because they're just a linear model. But you should not be convinced that these actually work. Like, how do I know that they actually approximate this model output function f that I was talking about earlier? All I said is that I'm going to fit a linear model um, like from the subsets to the output vector. How do we evaluate that these things actually worked? And the idea is really simple. We're just going to look at the out of sample performance of our uh, linear regression. So we're going to sample a bunch of new subsets that we didn't sample in the training process, uh, SI of the training set. And then we're going to compare data model predictions uh, of the model outputs to reality. And so we're going to aggregate over a bunch of different target examples. Each target example has its own separate data model and a bunch of different random subsets SI of the CIFAR training set, again, unseen. Um, and so what I'm about to show you is a scatter plot where the x-axis is going to be the predicted margin for a specific target example and a specific random subset. Uh, and the way I'm going to get the predicted margin again is I'm just going to take the dot product of the characteristic vector of the subset with the data model for the target example. And on the y-axis, I'm going to show the actual margin. Um, so I'm going to run, I'm going to take that subset. I'm going to uh, run, train like a bunch of models just to eliminate any randomness. I'm going to look at the average margin across all of those models on the specific example x. So every dot in the scatter plot corresponds to a specific target example and a specific random subset. And what we find is this really, really tight correspondence um, between the predicted margins and the actual margins. And this holds um, not just in aggregate over target examples and random subsets, but in the sort of zoomed in colorful view here, uh, I've shown uh, the same points, but just color coded by a uh, target example. So even within a specific target example, we're able to predict the variation across random subsets pretty well. Okay, so this is kind of surprising in the sense that data models successfully predicted the result of end-to-end uh, -end training, even though end-to-end -end training here was um, sort of training a deep neural network on an image data set, not exactly a, a simple model class. Uh, and so there's this whole question as to why this happens. And I'm not gonna talk about this at all in this presentation, but there's some recent, uh, there's some recent work out of Princeton that actually tries to answer this question. Uh, instead of talking about why this works, I sort of want to say, what can we use this for? How can we leverage the fact that data models successfully predict model outputs um, to better understand models and data? Okay. And so what we have is this primitive where whenever we want to know um, what would happen if I trained on this training set S and I evaluate S prime and I evaluate it on this test example X, and I want to know what would happen, what, uh, what would my loss be on x? I can instead just do this simple inner product and get an approximation. So what do we use this for? Uh, in our paper, we show that uh, data models actually provide a really, really versatile framework for analyzing both models and data. And we did this through a bunch of different applications. And I'm only going to talk about two in this presentation. Uh, so the first, uh, we, looked at, uh, we used data models to analyze model brittleness. Uh, to predict what we call data counterfactuals, to find similar training images to a given target, uh, detect, train text, uh, detect train test leakage uh, in modern data sets, and then as a uh, rich embedding that includes latent structure in the data. And so in this presentation, I'm only really going to talk about the first one and then a bit of the last one. Okay, so let's start with the first one. How do we use data models to analyze model brittleness? And so what I mean by model brittleness, just to be super clear, is here's a boat from the CIFAR 10 test set. This is correctly classified as a boat um, with 71% confidence, and it's also consistently classified as a boat. So if I train you know, 100 random models, 90% of them will classify this as a boat. But it turns out that if I remove just nine images from the CIFAR 10 training set, I don't mislabel them or anything. I just take them out of the training set. 
then models trained on the remaining, you know, 49,991 images confidently and consistently classify this boat as an airplane. And so even though this boat uh, wasn't brittle in the like um, maybe natural sense that we think of, it's brittle in the sense that, sorry, it's brittle in the sense that just removing a handful of images from the training set was enough to consistently flip model predictions on this boat. And so the question is how prevalent is this phenomenon in the data set? Um, like, is it the case that all images can be flipped by just taking out nine training images? We're not sure. And so we answer this question with data models. Um, I'm gonna skip over the statistics. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it in a few slides actually. Okay, so the question we're interested in answering is what is the largest set of training examples that's necessary for the model to learn uh, a target example X? Or alternatively, maybe a more natural way to put it is what's the smallest set of training examples that we can remove from the training set to make the, mis the model misclassify a specific target example X. Um, and so more visually, we have an image X, say this image of a plane, and I wanna ask what's sort of the largest counterfactual training set so that the model eventually um, predicts incorrectly on, uh, on X. So one problem with this, uh, one thing we might think to do is like, let's just try all, like, let's just try removing all possible random subsets of the data. Um, the problem obviously is that there are exponentially many of these subsets to try. We can't possibly, you know, try two to the 50,000 um, possible subsets. And so we need to do something smarter. What we're actually going to do is use data models as the proxy for model output. Um, and we're going to basically use the output of a data model to perform a guided search over these subsets rather than just a random search. Okay, and the results are here. Um, so in, on the x-axis here uh, <clears throat> is the number of training examples needed to flip a given prediction. Uh, and the y-axis is the fraction of the CIFAR-10 test set that can be flipped by removing you know, x-axis number of training examples. So the way you should interpret this, for example, is I'm trying to get a pointer to work, but it's not quite working. Um, but the way you should interpret this is about 70% of the training set can be flipped by removing 500, uh, you know, test example specific training examples, uh, or maybe more strikingly, 40% uh, of the training set can be flipped by removing just 200 examples. Things get even worse if instead of removing the examples, we mislabel them. That's the orange line. And yeah, sort of overall, what we found is, and this is another point on this graph, is that 25% of the uh, test set can be flipped by removing just uh, 100 or 0.2% of the training examples. Uh, and so you might ask, okay, is this really enabled by data models? Couldn't we have done this with any sort of like similarity metric? Um, like if I took the nearest 100 points in representation space and then removed them, would that be enough? Or if I uh, took the 100 most influential points as measured by like an influence function approximation. Uh, and what we showed in our paper is that, no, this is actually something kind of unique to data models. Um, and so this blue line here corresponds exactly to the blue line in the left plot. Uh, and then the rest of them, uh, the rest of the other lines are basically uh, some form of similarity metric between the test set and the training set. Uh, and they correspond to removing that many training uh, images using the methods uh, using the methods corresponding to the line. Um, and what we find is that all of these baselines perform much, much worse um, than data models. Uh, I'll pause again in case there are questions. I also. Uh, I had a question actually, because you mentioned that you want to, you compare to, to random search, but if you use some other heuristics to drive the search, I guess, I guess it's not fair just to use random search as baseline. Yeah, so random is just the purple line. Um, each of the other lines uses another uh, similarity metric to drive the search. Um, so on the right, like just like the very small purple line at the very bottom is random search. But for example, like the red line uses influence functions to guide the search. Uh, the green line uses representation space distance to guide the search and so on. And how about techniques that, that are used in active learning or input selection? 
So there are techniques in this kind of literature that try to find the right example to use in the training or in the test. Uh, yeah. Could they be used uh, as well here? That, that's a great question. Uh, it's not in the paper, but we tried like, these were the best methods we found. Like we tried a lot of different methods. Um, I'm happy to talk offline if you, think, if you think we missed one, but we tried like probably upwards of 10 or 15 different methods for guiding the search. Okay, great, thank you. Cool. Uh, okay, so I'll keep going, but again, feel free to interrupt. Uh, the second application that I wanted to talk about um, is using data models as an embedding. Um, and what I mean by this more precisely is that for a given target example X, the weights of the data model, um, the data model being you know, a 50,000 dimensional vector, define an embedding of the target image in like R to the 50,000. So for example, if I have this image of an airplane, I can think of its data model as an embedding in R to 50,000, where the ith coordinate of this embedding corresponds to how important the ith training example is for this test example. Um, and what we'll find in the coming slides is that this embedding comes with actually a really nice structure and more importantly, what we call a universal interpretation. So regardless of what model I'm studying, um, as long as the training data set is the same, the ith coordinate of this representation always means the same thing. It's always how important was the ith training example for the output on X. Uh, and so what this means is, uh, what this means is that we can apply dimensionality reduction techniques, for example. So if we take this in uh, the, like a big matrix of all of the data models for all of the test examples uh, stacked on top of one another, uh, what we get are these sort of directions in training set space uh, that intuitively correspond to features. Um, and so you can think, uh, if we look, for example, at this uh, second principal component here, the second row, what this actually means is that there's some direction in training set space where sort of increasing along that direction, which means it's like upweighting those training examples, causes you to think that the images on the left are um, more like, causes you to improve your performance more and more on the images on the left while hurting your performance on the images on the right. And similarly, downweighting those images should help your uh, performance on the images on the right while hurting your performance on the images on the left. Uh, and even further, the explained variance of these PCA components, um, which is, uh, yeah, the explained variance of the components gives us some measure of feature importance to model predictions. And we can actually make this precise, but I, I won't do it on these slides. Um, but there's a way to actually relate the explained variance of each principal component to how important this feature is for this model class. Okay, so what can we do with this primitive? Like PCA looks cool, um, you know, there are features, that's nice, um, but what does this actually give me? What utility does this uh, provide? And so to answer that question, I want to talk about um, one follow-up work we did on model class comparison. And this is joint work with my collaborators, Sam Park, Harshay Shah, and again, Alexander Madri. Um, again, I, maybe I'll stop for like 10 seconds just because I can't see anyone um, in case there are any questions about the last couple of slides. All right, sounds great. I'll keep going then. Uh, okay, so the application here is model class comparison. So what do I mean by that? Well, we know that sort of developing machine learning pipelines entails making a bunch of different design choices. I might need to uh, choose which architecture to use, which training methodology to use, um, which optimizer parameters to use, whether I should use data augmentation or not, and what data augmentation to use. And even further than that, we know that these de uh, design choices aren't meaningless. They actually change the inductive biases of the resulting models. Um, so for example, there's this paper from Stanford and Google um, that finds for a bunch of different image net models trained with a bunch of different, uh, different values of these design choices. They had vastly different um, amounts of what's called texture bias, even though the models themselves barely changed in accuracy. So the variance in accuracy was less than 1% between models. And yet some of them are super vulnerable to uh, what's called texture bias, uh, 
and others were not. Similarly, um, this paper again out of Stanford uh, found that even for a bunch of models with the exact same loss on a pre-training data set had a vastly different downstream performance after fine tuning. And so we know that these model, these design choices aren't, uh, they aren't meaningless, they're not no-ops, they're actually important. And so this motivates us to understand them. Um, so we might want to ask for a specific design choice, whether that's you know, using data augmentation or pre-training versus not pre-training or changing optimizer parameters. How does that specific design choice change the specific um, model biases and result, as a result, model predictions um, of, the, of the learning algorithm? And so to answer this question, we're going to again turn to this sort of data models as embeddings view that I presented a couple of slides ago. Um, so this is a recap from just, I guess, two minutes ago. So I won't go too far. Um, I won't go too far in depth, but again, we can think of a data model for a specific test example X. Uh, we can think of that data model as, um, we can think of that data model as providing an embedding for X in the space of the training data set. So an R50,000 in this case, where each coordinate of this embedding, again, corresponds to how important is the ith training example for this test example. So how do we use this to compare learning algorithms? Well, given two learning algorithms, um, let's call them algorithm one and algorithm two, we can actually uh, compute a data model for each test example both under algorithm one and under algorithm two. And as I was saying before, the jth coordinate of these data model embeddings means precisely the same thing for algorithm one as it does for algorithm two. And so the fact that they lie in sort of the same space allows us to make a direct comparison between the learning algorithms in a way that wouldn't be possible, for example, if we were interested, if we were looking at, um, I don't know, last layer representation, for example. Um, where you sort of have to do a bunch of work to align these representations. So given that they're in the same, uh, given that they're in the same sort of training set space, what we can actually do is take the two data models, the one for algorithm one and the, the one for algorithm two, and kind of subtract them. Um, not exact, uh, in our paper, we don't exactly subtract them. We sort of subtract the normalized data models, but you can just think of it as subtracting. And so what we're going to end up with is a vector whose very positive components correspond to training examples that are really important for algorithm one, but not really important for algorithm two, and whose very negative coordinates correspond to training examples that are very important for algorithm two, but maybe not that important for algorithm one. Uh, and we call that subtracted data model, uh, here denoted as theta x one minus two. We call that the residual data model. Cool. Now, the one problem is that these residual data models capture uh, differences between the two model classes on a per example level. So going back a slide, it answers for this airplane, what are the training examples that model that algorithm one uses, but algorithm two doesn't use and vice versa. But we're interested in drawing much broader conclusion. We want sort of population level uh, effects. And so what we're going to do is we're going to leverage this, uh, the tool from a few slides ago, uh, again, PCA to extract global differences between the two learning algorithms rather than just local ones. And so what this looks like is we're going to take the residual data models, uh, both one minus two and two minus one, uh, and look at sort of the, I see a question in the chat. Um, uh, great, I, sorry, I just saw the chat. Um, and the question was to compute the uh, data models for both algorithm one and two, do you need to repeat the same training procedure of 500,000 models? Um, that's a great question. You do have to train the models for both model classes. Um, we do show that you don't actually need 500,000 for this application of data models. Um, like we only trained 10,000 per model class. Um, and I guess in some upcoming work that I'm not talking about today, we'll show how to do it with just like 10 models. Um, but for this paper, we trained 10,000 models of each model class. Does that answer the question? Yeah. 
Perfect. Yeah, let me know if there are any other questions. Um, and I'm also happy to talk about the, the upcoming work offline too, which I'm pretty excited about. Okay, great. Okay, so where I left off is we were going to run PCA, principal component analysis, on these uh, computed residual data models. And we're going to plot uh, for each kind of principal component, it's explained variance under uh, model class A or algorithm one against its explained variance for model class B. So given any vector in R to the 50,000, and I can compute the explained variance of that vector under both um, the data models from algorithm one, the original ones, and the data models from algorithm two. And let's say this is the line x equals y. This is a cartoon plot, by the way. This isn't, this isn't real data. If I see dots that lie on x equals y, those correspond to training directions that are roughly equally important for algorithm one and algorithm two. Um, and so I'm not super interested in them for the purpose of comparing the two algorithms. But if I see training directions that are super off this line, so for example, um, under the x equals y line, these correspond to training uh, directions, again, like uh, vectors in our uh, size of training set that are in general, much more important for algorithm one than they are for algorithm two. And this is aggregated across all the test examples because we ran PCA on the whole test example uh, matrix. And so we can sort of break things down into three steps. We're going to run this PCA and find directions that explain a lot more variance for one data model than they do for the other. Okay, the second step is once we've identified that direction, we're going to study uh, uh, test examples whose data models heavily align with that direction to get an idea of what sort of test examples are affected by that training direction. And then the third step is uh, once we look at those test examples and we make a hypothesis about what separates the two model classes, we're going to verify that hypothesis uh, by what we call counterfactual analysis. And so I'll make these three steps much more complete over the next few slides. Okay, so let's start with step one, finding distinguishing directions. Um, and just to make things super concrete, let's say algorithm one uh, is pre-training a model in ImageNet and then fine tuning it on this data set called Waterbirds. Um, and knowing what Waterbirds is, isn't super important. It's just any data set um, of, it's actually a data set of birds and your task is to classify whether they're water birds or land birds. Um, algorithm two is going to be training from scratch on this water birds data set. So not fine tuning on ImageNet, uh, not pre-training on ImageNet. And our goal is to understand what makes models pre-trained on ImageNet different from models directly trained on this water birds data set. Okay. So we're going to do the same steps as before. We're going to compute data models for algorithm one, compute data models for algorithm two, subtract them to get these residual data models, run PCA, and then make the same plot as before. So each of these dots is a principal component from PCA. And again, the x-axis is how much variance they explain under uh, the data model matrix from algorithm one. And the y-axis is how much variance they explain uh, in the data model matrix from algorithm two. And so I've highlighted this red dot here, or sorry, all of these dots over here are directions that impact ImageNet models that are like models that are pre-trained on ImageNet much more than they impact models that are directly trained on Waterbirds. And so we're gonna focus on just one of these directions. So again, this dot corresponds to some vector in R50,000. And we're gonna take a closer look and ask what does this direction actually correspond to? Okay, so this is the same plot again, and I've highlighted the same red dot. If I look uh, through the ImageNet test set for the subpopulation of test examples, whose data models most align with this extracted direction, what I get is this set of images. Um, and so if you're familiar with the Waterbirds data set, something might stick out on you, if uh, something might stick out at you here, if you're not, that's totally fine. The weird thing about all of these images is that every single one of them has a face in the background. And this is not normal for Waterbirds. Waterbirds is a data set of um, land backgrounds and water backgrounds planted onto land birds and water birds. Um, and so faces are actually a very low prevalence throughout the data set. Uh, 
And so we sort of looked at this and thought, okay, what this says is that for some reason, the model pre-trained on ImageNet cares a lot more about images with faces in them. Um, why could that be? Well, one possible explanation is that when you pre-train on ImageNet, you sort of already learned this feature for face. And on the water birds data set, uh, it turns out that there are more land birds on land than water birds on land. And so face is actually a pretty predictive feature of the class land bird. And so we guessed, I'm um, sorry. And so we guessed that the models that were pre-trained on ImageNet were using faces as a shortcut for predicting the class land bird. Um, and so, okay, this is like a nice story. Uh, like it's got a cool narrative, but how do we know that this is actually true? Um, how do we know that this is actually what's happening in these models? And so this is the third step, which is uh, which we call counterfactual analysis. So recall, our hypothesis is that ImageNet trained models, but not models trained from scratch on water birds, spuriously rely on a human face to predict the land bird class. And so what we do is we design an input transformation that adds a random, a random patch of a face to a bunch of different images from the water birds data set. Um, so these are all just like, you know, randomly applied on with uh, a script. These are not natural data, uh, natural images from the data set, obviously. And so by applying, um, by applying this transformation to random test images, we can look at sort of the treatment effect on this transformation for image net trained models versus models trained from scratch. And what we find is exactly what we hypothesized. So for models trained uh, with image net pre-training, inserting this small patch of a face actually does increase your predicted probability of land bird. But for um, models trained directly on water birds, it doesn't really have any sort of significant effect. Um, and what's even more promising is that as you increase the size of this planted face, um, as you increase the size of this planted face, the effect size gets larger and larger and larger. And so this is pretty good evidence that indeed, models pre-trained on, uh, pre on ImageNet actually do spuriously rely uh, on the presence of a face to predict the land bird class. And so in just a few steps, we were able to identify um, from basically nothing, like we didn't come in with this hypothesis, we were able to identify this human face bias um, that's introduced only via ImageNet pre-training. I mean, the interesting thing is that ImageNet pre-training is sort of seen, at least for water birds, as like a universally good thing. Like it improves your accuracy, it improves your minority group accuracy. And so without doing this sort of in-depth analysis, you'd think that just pre-training on ImageNet is sort of a no-brainer. Um, but it turns out that it introduces this spurious correlation that you, um, that's sort of tough to find with uh, standard tools. Um, this isn't all we studied in our paper. We also studied uh, data augmentation. I actually missed one here. We studied ImageNet pre-training. We studied data augmentation and we studied uh, optimizer hyperparameters as well as some other sort of smaller examples. Um, and another one of our findings that I thought is really cool uh, is that when you train with data augmentation, uh, you amplify what are called co-occurrence biases. So models trained with data augmentations um, are actually much more sensitive to the presence of a spider web to predict spider, um, or to the presence of polka dots to predict uh, a salamander or whatever. Um, and so you can read uh, a lot more about that in our paper. Cool, so just to wrap up, uh, in this talk, I introduced data models, which is our framework for understanding both uh, training data and model predictions. The main idea was to learn a data to output mapping with supervised learning. We sampled a bunch of random subsets of the training set, uh, trained models on them, recorded the outputs, and then uh, trained a supervised model to predict the output from the subset. And just a really simple linear instantiation of this idea worked really well. Uh, after, this linear, after we instantiated the idea with this linear instantiation, what we got was a versatile tool for model data understanding that we use to analyze brittle predictions, um, predict counterfactuals, and most recently compare model classes. And if you have any more questions, you can of course uh, contact me or read either of the papers, which are both here. Uh,
And with that, I wanted to leave a bunch of time for questions. Um, the paper links are here. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for this talk. Very insightful and uh, very nice idea. The data models for different applications. Um, if anyone has a question, you can just pick up or write it in the chat and they will relay it to Andrew. I, I do have a small question because you mentioned that there are different applications and you only focus on two of them. Would you mm -hmm. briefly introduce the two others that you skipped? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, I'd also recommend checking out the paper if you're interested because I think there are a lot. Um, but the other two that I was debating talking about were um, predicting what we call data counterfactuals. Um, which is exactly sort of stress testing this counterfactual prediction uh, property and asking like, what if I try to adversarially pick subsets of the training set and I want to ask, and I want to know what's going to happen when I remove um, these specific training images, not just random training images. Um, and we find that data models are still pretty predictive there. Um, and then the second one was identifying train test leakage. Um, and you can sort of think of this as uh, like normally when we want to identify train test leakage, we just care about finding images that look similar to each other. But here you're sort of asking like, data models allow us to ask, what is the train test leakage? Where's the train test leakage that is actually giving me unfair accuracy? Like where am I using an identical training image to make the prediction on a given test image? Um, and so it sort of allows you to give some meaningful quantification of uh, the train test leakage that exists in the data set. Thank you very much. Any final questions? Um, if there is no questions, uh, I would like to thank you again, Andrew, for this talk, and thank everyone for joining today.